In 1992, Eileen Warnos was convicted of murdering a man in Florida. He had picked her up by the side of the road, thinking she was a sex worker. When Warnos got into the car, she shot him and dumped the body by the side of the road. She later admitted to killing three more men, but authorities believe she was responsible for at least three more murders, and likely a fourth. By the time Warnos was arrested, the United States was relatively numb to news of serial killings, but Eileen's case fascinated the nation. And in 2003, Charlize Theron won an Oscar for her portrayal of the unhinged killer. Why did Warnos's case fascinate the nation? Mostly because female serial killers are exceedingly rare. But, as you may know, one of the most prolific serial killers in history may have been a woman. The infamous Elizabeth Battery of medieval Hungary. Today, a day in history is going to tell you about Delphine Lalaurie, the rich and privileged killer of colonial Louisiana, who managed to elude justice and die peacefully in bed 30 years after the crimes she committed. In 1692, France laid claim to the area that is now the US state of Louisiana, which they named after the greatest of all French kings, Louis XIV. Twenty years later, the area around what is now New Orleans was explored, and in 1722, the French moved their colonial capital from Biloxi to La Nouvelle Orléans, named after the ancient French city of Orleans, southwest of Paris. In 1763, Spain gained control of the city through a secret protocol in the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Seven Years' War between France and England, known in the United States as the French and Indian War. In 1800, the Spanish, under threat from Napoleon Bonaparte, returned Louisiana to the French. You may know that in 1803, the French Emperor sold almost all of France's possessions in continental North America to the growing United States. That was all far in the future in March 1787, when Marie Delphine McCarthy, or McCarthy was born in New Orleans. All four of Delphine's grandparents had moved to Louisiana from Ireland and France, which is why her maiden name is a combination of French and Irish names. Her parents moved in the wealthy society of the city, and when she was just 13, she was married off to a Spanish colonial nobleman, whose uncle was the colonial governor of Louisiana and Florida. In 1804, Delphine's husband, who had become the Spanish consul general in New Orleans when it became American, was called to Spain to give a report, but died in Havana, Cuba, en route. While in Cuba, the now widowed Delphine gave birth to the first of her five children, and returned to New Orleans shortly afterward. In 1808, she married a Frenchman, Jean Blanc, a banker, merchant, and legislator in the city. Blanc died in 1816, and nine years later, Delphine became Madame La Lorie, when she married the much younger but wealthy doctor, Leonard Louis La Lorie. She bought property in the French Quarter, at 1140 Royal Street under her own name, and a couple of years later built a two-story mansion there. It was in this mansion that La Lorie became a monster. It's been 158 years since the end of the US Civil War, which ended slavery in the United States. But, as you likely know, not only is the system of slavery in the US under renewed scrutiny in the last few years, but so are the many issues that sprung from it. We here at A Day in History are very aware that for many Americans of all backgrounds, slavery is still an exceedingly touchy subject and provokes intense feelings. Before we briefly discuss the lives of slaves in the time of La Lorie, we want to say that it's possible that our many viewers coming from everywhere in the world might find something to object to in the following description, and perhaps our use of language. Any offense is definitely unintentional, and we welcome your polite, insightful thoughts in the comments section below. There's no way to sugarcoat it. Whoever was enslaved, whether they worked in a luxurious mansion like La Lorie's, in a rural plantation manor, or worked in the fields and on the farms, had no freedom. 
Some might say that enslaved people working inside a manor house had privileges that those in the cane and cotton fields did not. But the bottom line is, none of the people who were enslaved experienced freedom in the literal sense of the word. They were not the masters of their own fates. Their children were often taken from them and sold to someone else, never to be seen again. Sexual abuse was rampant, and violent physical abuse was an everyday occurrence. Even the most elderly, literate, and privileged domestic in a luxurious manor house could not leave of their own accord or truly speak their minds. There were laws that, at least in theory, protected slaves from murder and unwarranted abuse, but these laws were most often honored in the breach. On rural farms and plantations, slaves who were killed or died through neglect were often disposed of in some remote location. If, on the off chance, someone was questioned about their disappearance, a story might be concocted. That particular person was planning a revolt, successfully ran away, whereabouts unknown, struck or otherwise attacked a white person, etc. Slavery existed throughout the United States when it was formed in 1776, though it was less prevalent in the North, and especially New England, where many leading abolitionists lived to the time of the Civil War. North or South, but especially in the South, where millions of slaves were held, escape or rebellion was punished swiftly and severely. Beatings, whippings, being chained in awful contraptions to limit movement, and much else were the fates of enslaved people, who were caught escaping or who planned a rebellion. During Delphine Lalaurie's early life, three serious slave rebellions occurred near New Orleans. In one of these rebellions, two slave owners were killed. The result of that and the other rebellions. Virtually all of the slaves involved, and they were mostly male, were captured and decapitated. Worse still, their heads were put on pikes and displayed on the roads leading to the places from which they had escaped. A lesson to those who might be entertaining the idea of freedom. That was slavery. However, if a slave owner or any other free person was proven to have killed an enslaved person for their own sick pleasure, there were criminal penalties on the books. The problem with proving someone guilty was that often the only witnesses, if there were any, were black. In 99 times out of 100, their word counted for nothing. Testimony against a white slave owner could easily result in violent repercussions and other punishments, like the sale of a wife or husband to someone hundreds of miles away. On April 10, 1834, La Lorie's mansion in the French Quarter caught fire. People nearby ran to the mansion in an attempt to put out the flames and help people escape the smoke and flames. Luckily for the neighborhood, the fire was put out before the building was destroyed, and because it could easily have spread engulfing the entire crowded section of the city. When it was safe to enter, seven enslaved people were found in the attic. Some were dead, while others were barely hanging on to life. The fire had not touched them, and they had not died of smoke inhalation. They had been tortured. In a newspaper article written shortly after the grisly discovery, La Lorie, who could not be found, was described as the demon in the shape of a woman. La Lorie's victims had been suspended and stretched, which caused trouble breathing in addition to pain in the legs, arms, and spine. The flesh had also been torn away from the bodies and places. It was also apparent that some victims had been confined in the attic for several months, and slowly tortured until they finally died. At a time before photography, and when word of mouth passed more quickly than newspaper articles, differing accounts of what happened in La Lorie's House of Horrors spread through the city. Unsubstantiated reports told of one woman who had been wrapped in human entrails. Hers or those of someone else is unknown. Holes were bored through the skull of at least one victim, and a sensational report had spoons nearby, supposedly to stir the victim's brains, which suggests cannibalism. One woman had her bones repeatedly broken to the point that she resembled a crab. 
all of them had the flesh stripped away from some parts of their bodies. Rumor had it that Lalaurie's property, including her well, was the final resting place of many other victims. Some stories said over 100, though this is a clear exaggeration. At the time, Lalaurie's third husband was questioned by a local judge, who visited the scene and was told that it would be better if some people had better stay at home, rather to come to others' houses to dictate laws and meddle in other people's business. That was the attitude of the third husband. Delphine Lalaurie and her children could not be found. There is very little detail about Lalaurie's third husband, but apparently he was never charged with a crime. The house was in his wife's name and he did not stay there. Fortunately for Delphine Lalaurie and her children, she fled New Orleans shortly after the discovery, for the entire city was outraged by what they read and heard about what had gone on at 1142 Royal Street. Over 4,000 people had also seen what Lalaurie had done, for the bodies of the dead were displayed publicly to show how evil Lalaurie was. A mob of hundreds, if not more, made its way to the fire-damaged mansion and tore most of it apart. The sadistic mistress of the house would never return to New Orleans. However, her children later told journalists and others that their mother had wanted to return for years, hoping enough time would have passed for most in New Orleans to forget or overlook what had happened to mere slaves. Her children reportedly told her in plain terms never to return, and denied knowing anything about the horrors that had gone on in their mother's home. At the time of the murders and for many years after, there were no extradition treaties for wanted criminals that fled overseas. Lalaurie is recorded to have died in Paris in 1849, 15 years after her evil deeds had been discovered. Apparently, she had been bitter all that time for not being able to return home. We hope that you learned something from today's video, and we hope that you return to our channel for more videos on a wide variety of topics, mostly dark and macabre like the one you just saw. Please like and subscribe, and tap the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new releases. Thank you for watching.